Stay tuned for this message by Sam Adeyemi. All right, we're reading from Psalm 105 and verse 37. Let's go. He also brought them out with silver and gold, and there was none feeble among his tribes. He brought them out with silver and gold. There was none feeble among his tribes. Our discussion is on the covenant of wealth. With the covenant of wealth. I have seen the ravages of poverty in our country, around the world, and it breaks my heart. Solomon said in the Proverbs, the poor man's poverty is his destruction. Poverty is a destroyer. First, it translates into physical reality for many people in our country. The reality is premature death, life expectancy short in countries where there's poverty, the lack of proper infrastructure you know, causes a loss of human dignity. Human beings are treated like animals. The unlimited value of human life is unrealized. Human potential is frustrated. And that translates into statistics. Infant mortality rate the rate at which children die before the age of five in the country. Our country has one of the highest rates. Maternal mortality rate, the rate at which pregnant women die either during pregnancy or during delivery. We have one of the highest in the world. Preventable traumatic deaths caused mostly by accidents on the roads. So it's everywhere. See people dying just because they can't afford 20,000 or 30,000 naira to pay for surgery. It's heartbreaking. So when I think about it, I think about the level of corruption in the country. I think about the amount of resources available to us as a country, especially human resources and natural resources. And, and, you know, I compare that to the level of corruption. I realize that probably the greatest negative effect that poverty has had on our country is the erosion of moral values. And I remember what Dr. Billy Graham said, that when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. He said when character is lost, all is lost. Because real wealth is intangible. If you don't have values, you won't have value. So when poverty results in the erosion of honesty, erosion of love, okay, and sensitivity to other people, Erosion of generosity. When poverty results in the fueling of selfishness, then there's a big disaster. That's when the real problem happens. And I've seen that happen over the last few decades in our church. And I mean in our country. I've seen that happen over the last few decades in our country. Erosion of moral values on a massive scale. So I have seen that it is difficult, though not impossible, for a poor man to be a good citizen. Even though Solomon says that the poor man is better than the liar. I tasted a bit of deprivation myself in this country. I found a way out through God's system. And I am passionate about communicating that way out. We are part of a system of government that is superior to any system that man will ever build. 
We're part of God's kingdom. And God's system has a solution for poverty. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. See, God has a solution for the poverty problem. Today we have a global economic recession. Economies are being unraveled all over the world. People are puzzled. Some of the best economists that we have in our world are puzzled at the moment. But I make bold to say that God's system has the solution to the poverty problem. As we discuss the covenant of wealth, let's refer back to the verse of scripture that we read, Psalm 105, verse 37. He brought them forth also with silver and gold. And this is referring to Israel, the nation of Israel, when God brought them out of Egypt and was taking them to Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. And I want to understand why and how God would bring out a whole nation that had been in slavery and turn them into a prosperous nation overnight. Israel broke free from years of slavery and penury because of God's covenant with Abraham, period. Almighty God caught a covenant made an agreement, entered into a contract with a man named Abram. Let's read Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, as we remind ourselves of what this covenant or agreement was all about. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. That was the agreement. If you read chapter 13, the first two verses... It says, then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Verse 2 says, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Exciting. In Genesis 15, you would see God caught this covenant with Abram when he told Abraham to kill some animals, shed the blood, and both of them passed through. In Genesis 17, God told Abraham to circumcise himself and every male in his family as a sign of the covenant, an agreement. Hmm. The thing about a covenant is that it changes your status. When you enter into a blood covenant relationship, which is the highest form of agreement known to God and man. Your life becomes mixed with that of the person you are in covenant with. All that belongs to that person belongs to you. All that belongs to you belongs to that person whenever you need those resources. Whatever threatens the other person's life is threatening your own. Whatever you will do to protect your life, you must do to protect the other person's life. That is what God entered into with Abraham. So you observe that when your life and God's life are mixed together, you can never remain the same. You and God have become one. That changes your status. Because eventually it changed Abraham's name. And the things that could dominate Abraham before could not handle him anymore. They couldn't handle him anymore. Hmm. 
if barrenness could hold Abraham before, it eventually lost its grip over his body because the man was now one with God. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. So it means that when you enter into a blood covenant relationship with God, you have stepped into the realm of possibilities. No being, whether spirit or human, no system, no government can stop what God wants to do in your life when you're in a covenant with God. In Genesis chapter 14, after Lot, Abraham's nephew had separated from him and gone to live in Sodom, the armies of three countries came together and attacked Sodom and surrounding cities. Took Lot and his wife away, the whole family, other families, all their goods and properties, took everything away. When Abraham had, the Bible says that he took 318 trained servants from his house, went after those armies of nations, defeated them, and brought Lot back and all his goods. The armies of nations could not defeat Abraham anymore. He and God were now one. If Abraham fought a battle, it wasn't only the physical army that you saw. Angels had to be there. This covenant with God that we're talking about guarantees divine protection. It guarantees material wealth. It guarantees spiritual wealth. Because what Abraham got was called blessed. It guarantees health, sound health. Because the very life of God begins to flow in your system. Zoe, the quality of life that flows in God that can never be dominated by sicknesses and diseases. Isaac, because the covenant is transgenerational. Covenant, blood covenants by their nature are transgenerational. God already told Abraham the day he blessed him, I'll bless your seed also. So Isaac got the same blessing. He was part of the same covenant. There was famine in Genesis 26. Isaac wanted to go down to Egypt like his own father did when there was a famine. And God showed up and said, Isaac, stay here. See? The blood covenant guarantees divine direction. Your life can't be one with God and God will leave you roaming about, wandering aimlessly through life. He becomes your shepherd. You see, he is under obligation to share with you what he knows about situations and circumstances and about your life. He knows not only your past, he knows also the future. He shares that with you. It's in Psalm 25 verse 12. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. He will show them the covenant. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him will he teach to choose the way that is best for him. He will lead you. He will guide you. So he shows up to Isaac and says, well, yes, your father went down to Egypt. You don't have to go down to Egypt. Don't go. Stay here. If you obey me like your father did, I'll bless you here. And then we're told later on in Genesis 26 that Isaac sold that same year. And he reaped a hundredfold. Got the bumper harvest. The citizens began to envy him. Jacob went down to his uncle's house. His uncle Laban. And the man was trying to cheat Jacob. He didn't know who he was dealing with. Jacob had the Abrahamic covenant. You cannot impoverish someone that God has decided to prosper. Ten times Laban changed his wages. Ten times God changed the equation and caused Jacob to be more prosperous than Laban, his uncle. You can't stop it. Because they were dealing with livestock and the agreement would be, okay, the spotted ones and the ring straight ones would be yours. Anytime they said that, angels would show up, punch the genetic codes in the genes of those animals, and they will produce. The fat ones would produce spotted ones because that was the agreement that they would be Jacob's own. Then when his boss saw what was going on, he would change the agreement. No, no, no. The plain colored ones would be yours now. Then the angels would come. They would punch keys in the genetic codes of those animals, and all of them would give back to plain colored ones. What do you want to do? He's in a covenant with God. 
So when God showed up in Egypt to lead Israel out of poverty and out of slavery, it was because of the covenant. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Exodus chapter 2 from verse 23, it says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. The reason why God showed up, why God stepped in, was because of his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Covenants are transgenerational, sir. It was a covenant. And because in Genesis 15, he had told Abraham, your descendants will go to a foreign country. They'll be there 400 years, then I'll bring them back to this land that I promised you, and they'll possess it. And it was just about the same time that they now cried out to God. What did God ask them to do? At a point in time in the process, Moses told them, let each family take a lamb, kill it, take the blood, splash it on the doorpost. God will move through the nation. And it happened. God moved through. There was destruction in the nation. And then this nation of slaves found out now that when they walked up to the Egyptians and asked for anything, they got it. They were poor yesterday. This morning, they became prosperous because of the covenant, sir. Deuteronomy 8.18, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish the covenant which he swore to your fathers. For us as believers... Our material blessing and wealth has been provided for within the context of the covenant. When you are in a covenant, the responsibility that you have is to obey the terms of the covenant, not to beg. Once you obey the terms of the covenant, you are entitled to the benefits of the covenant. It's a contract. It's an agreement. Too many people begging for what they should simply demand for. But then there are too many people breaking the terms of the covenant, and they're now begging for the benefits of the covenant. It just doesn't work that way. So, this whole deal is about the covenant. I want to challenge us to be conscious of that, and to know that when you're in a covenant, you have the responsibility to know the terms of the covenant. Secondly, to obey the terms of the covenant. And that's what the book is about, the Bible. Read your Bible. Try to understand how this thing works. Number two, obey the covenant. The Bible is divided into two books. The Old Testament, the New Testament. The word testament is another word for covenant. The old covenant, the new covenant. In the old covenant, they sacrificed the blood of animals. In the new covenant, one lamb has been sacrificed for all of us, and that's Christ. Obey the terms of the covenant. If your poverty or your challenge tempts you to break the terms of the covenant, and you now begin to pray and to beg for the benefits of the covenant, you're wasting your time. Obey the terms of the covenant. So, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Verse 14 says that the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles, that they may receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We are entitled to the blessings of Abraham. But it's not enough for you to confess the blessings of Abraham are mine. That's not going to be enough. You need to match Abraham's level of commitment. 
when you are in a covenant what is required of you is character it's integrity we want the prosperity of Abraham but we usually don't talk about the integrity of Abraham if you say that you are in a covenant with God God will test you he will test your commitment that's why we have Genesis 22 from verse 1 God tested Abraham and told him Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and take him to the mountain that I will show you. You will sacrifice him to me there. God tested Abraham. God's going to test you. Are you a covenant keeper? Are you loyal? Are you faithful? Do you keep your promises? Why would you expect God's blessings to be yours when you are not willing to fulfill your part of the agreement? Listen. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, sacrifice him to me. Abraham took his son, built the altar, put the son there, lifted the knife, and was going to slash the boy's throat. And God said, stop. It was just a test. Why would Abraham go to that extent? One, because Abraham was a man of integrity who will keep his word, even at the risk of causing himself pain. Abraham was a man of integrity. Number two, Abraham knew who he was dealing with, that God can never lie. If this agreement ever fails, it will never be from God's end. It will only be from man's end. Abraham knew that, so he didn't want it to fail from his end. But on the other hand, he had his trust in God because in Hebrews 11, the Bible says that he was going to kill Isaac because he believed that God was going to raise him from the dead. Because God had told him that he was going to bless the whole world through that young man. He believed. Wow. So Abraham knew that his God was a God of miracles. A God of signs and wonders. A God that was unlimited in his power. You know, part of the puzzle that I see in our environment, I see that many people serve a very weak God. Not the God of the Bible. If after entering into a covenant with God, you need to scheme, you know, to make some little 5,000 there and some 50,000 there and, and some 210,000 there just to be able to cover your bill and all of that, and you call yourself a Christian, you can't trust God to meet your needs while you stay with the truth. The God that you say that you serve is a very weak God. If you have to mix anything else, Anything else with this God that you say you serve is a weak God indeed. The God of the Bible does not need your help. He is capable to fulfill his promises. He has never lied before and is now not going to lie when it's your turn. He has never changed and he will never change. Did I hear you say amen to that? If your confession or belief is, oh, you don't understand the forces, the forces that are against me. If the forces that are against you can frustrate the God that you say you serve, the one you serve is not the God of the Bible. It's not the same one as Abraham served. The one that I serve, there is no force, whether in existence or that will be invented, whether spirit or human, no system designed whether by man or by Satan that can ever stop the God that I serve and the one that Abraham served. Did I hear you say amen to that? I know that we live in an environment that is infested with the fear of witches and wizards, but to hell with all the witches in town. Once you allow the fear of witches, you are trapped, you are under a spell. There's no way you can realize the kind of blessing and prosperity God has released for you. Why didn't the witches stop Christ? Why should witches be people we need to be struggling with? When the Bible says enemies, it's not talking about human beings. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies. But today, we believe that human beings can stop us. Just because, I don't know. Today is a day of freedom. When you know the truth, it makes you free. I say once again, when you're in a covenant with God, no force, no being, whether spirit or human, no system, no government invented by man can ever stop the fulfillment of God's promises in your life. 
So my challenge, do the word. Do the word. If he says don't steal, don't steal. Stealing is beneath your dignity as someone who is in a covenant with God and whose status has changed and God has raised you to his level. Let me show you Abraham's standard. The day he fought that war and delivered Lot and everybody who had been in Sodom and the other cities. While he was coming back from that war, the king of Sodom met him and said, bring the people, take the rest. Abraham said, I have sworn to God that I will not take even the lace of a shoe so that you will not be able to say I made Abraham rich. Some people are stealing what does not belong to them. Abraham, he's made an offer by the head of government. Abraham says, I don't want anything from the government. I don't want a situation where the government will say that it was the one that made me rich. I want my prosperity to come. I want to prove something. That the God that I serve has the capacity to prosper me. This man was wealthier than countries. Okay, so keep it. Amen. <laughs> Only bring the tithe so that it can give that to God. Phenomenal. You now be stealing. For what? Let's prove God. Amen? Amen. It's either God is God or he is not. Let us prove God. There is a covenant of wealth. And it's available to us. Don't steal. Walk in love. That's what the word says. Walk in love. However difficult it may be. Be a covenant person. Be committed. Exercise ruthless obedience to the terms of this covenant. And let's see whether God will not fulfill his own part of this agreement. I believe that these last days, the power of the Spirit of God is coming on some people. And I'm talking about you. Nothing will be able to frustrate your journey to the fulfillment of destiny. I see God creating a new economic system in our country and around the world. And I believe that that system will eventually defeat every corrupt system in this nation. I believe it. I believe in the name of Jesus that good money is going to run this country and run the bad money out of the system (laughs) in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray that as you make a commitment here today to keep your covenant with God and to put your absolute trust in God to prosper you and to help you, I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that you are now positioned beyond the reach of Satan. Positioned beyond the reach of poverty. I declare that no curse will be able to hold you anymore or to affect your finances from here anymore. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I prophesy by the Spirit of God that whatever barrier or bars or limitations may have been built around your life, they crumble now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I declare a season of miracles, of signs, of divine intervention in your life. Angels showed up to help Jacob prosper. I declare angels will show up to help you prosper. I prophesy a new level of revelation for you. Things that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard. A new level of creativity opens up for you now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I prophesy by the Spirit of God that in your life now there will be inventions. You will hear simple instructions from God. When you obey those simple instructions, new wells of wealth will be opened up for you. I prophesy that relationships that God ordained for your blessing will become active now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I prophesy that God will give you divine acceleration. Those who are stealing will never catch up with you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray for the person here who says, Pastor Sam, please pray with me that God should forgive me. My lifestyle actually is not right with God. I'm a sinner. I don't have a covenant with God at all. I'm a sinner. Listen, Jesus paid for your sins and mine, shed the blood already. All we have to do is ask God to forgive us. He does. That's where the change comes. What happens to you is a miracle. The Spirit of God touches you, destroys the nature of sin from your heart, 
puts God nature in you. Everything changes from there. I want to pray with you very quickly. Very short prayer. Life-changing prayer. One minute will be done. Can you put your hand on your heart? Pastor Sam, I need for God to forgive my sins. I'm a sinner. I need for God to forgive my sins. Can you put your hand on your heart, please? Someone says, I've said this prayer before. I've been a born-again Christian. But I have backslidden into sin. If Jesus comes now, I'm not sure I will make heaven. I want God, I want to dedicate my life to Jesus. Can you also put your hand on your heart, please? I want to say a short prayer with you, but it's a life-changing one. If your hand is on your heart for this prayer, can you please stand by your chair where you are? We'll be done in one minute. Can you please stand? God bless you. You didn't come here today by accident. Don't let this environment destroy you. God wants to bless you, wants to give you a new beginning in every area of your life. If you're standing, please say this prayer after me. Dear God, I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me and to accept me as your child. In Jesus' name, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone who is standing in obedience to your voice, not just the voice of a man. And I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit will destroy the nature of sin over their lives. We thank you for the miracle of change in their lives today. In Jesus' name.